In part one, we saw how Oscar de la Vanger fought in World War I, where, despite being badly wounded several times, he would always willingly return to the front. Despite the end of the war, he managed to bring 600 men back to Germany from occupation duties in the East. He joined various Freikorps units fighting against socialist insurgents in Germany and ethnic Poles in Silesia. He was wounded once more in 1921 and this time it was bad enough to get him knocked out of the paramilitary for some time. He was an early member of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. He went to university and got a degree. When the Nazis were granted power in 1933, like many old fighters, he was given a job. However... He seems to have resented some of the jobs given to other old fighters, jobs they were clearly not capable of doing. This caused jealousy and Dillavanger found himself being investigated for rape amongst other charges. He went to prison and on getting out he decided to go to Spain and fight in the war there. His old friend from World War I, Gottlob Berger, took him under his wing. It was Berger who found a job which suited Dillavanger's particular skills. Gottlob Berger had the idea of having a special unit which would be used to do the particularly dirty work that the National Socialists needed. Himmler no doubt agreed with him. The idea was to use convicts who in working for the party and state could get their freedom in doing the unpleasant tasks that others may not wish to do. The idea is not new. In the 10th century, King Henry the Fowler, the Duke of Saxony and the first king in the Ottonian line had thought the same. In more recent times, we've seen how violent criminals have been actively recruited by the Russian Federation to fight the neo-Nazi Wagner group, with the consequential results once these criminals have served their time and returned to the communities from whence they came. It would seem that Gottlob Berger put the idea to Himmler to use poachers, who then brought it up with the Reich master of the hunt, Hermann Goering. I've heard it said that poachers were suggested because they're good shots. A poacher may be a good shot, possibly, but most poachers probably use traps and they're also good at tracking to find out where the best place is to place their traps. As a general rule, poachers poach in order to get meat to eat, and this is often a sign of poverty. In the case of this unit, the criminals probably had done other crimes as well. The skills of the poacher are skills most suited to anti-partisan warfare, and that was to be the speciality of Derlewanger. In May 1940, Derlewanger was given the task of forming the Orionberg Poacher Commando, with 80 previously convicted individuals who had been brought together at the Sachsenhausen concentration camp and given two months of training. Gottlob Berger selected around 60 of these prisoners for this purpose, most of whom had been convicted not only of poaching, but also of other crimes. On the 1st of September 1940, the Sonderkommando Dillewanger was relocated to the Lublin area. It was used here to guard camps where Jewish slave labourers were kept. After the invasion of the Soviet Union, Sonderkommando Dillewanger was moved to Lvov, which by then had reverted to its former Austrian name of Lemberg. Once more, the unit was guarding slave labour camps where the fate of the prisoners was of little interest to the guards. It would seem that the behaviour of this unit and atrocities it committed were, were not yet accepted, and at that time this led to even mass killers such as Odilo Globotnik and Friedrich Wilhelm Kruger wanting to disband it. However, Himmler, Berger and Victor Brack stuck with Dillewanger and moved the unit to somewhere where their behaviour was less open to scrutiny. In January 1942, by now faced with Soviet counterattacks at the front and increased partisan activity behind the lines, Berger had the unit relocated to occupied Belarus. On the 29th of January 1942, Dillewanger's unit was placed directly under the command staff of the Reichsführer SS and given a few days training. It was transferred to the higher SS and police leader of Central Russia, Kurt von Gottberg, on the 10th of February 1942, after its equipment and training had been completed.
The war against the partisans was on the whole only a war which created more partisans. In the massive advances made in 1941, the Wehrmacht had encircled large numbers of Red Army troops, but many of these troops were from the areas that had been encircled and thus could just go home taking their weapons with them. Later such groups were to become the nucleus of partisan groups. Whereas the Germans controlled to a large extent the roads and the railways, the partisans controlled the forests and the swamps. It was the brutality of the Nazi occupation and its racist policies which encouraged large groups of partisans to come together, largely for reasons of self-defence. However, in Moscow it was realised that such groups would be useful to disrupt supplies and so military aid was given to them. Thus an organisation of sorts was born. The partisans required food, which was obtained from local farmers, often at the point of a gun. The way that Delavang and others fought these partisans was to kill the civilians who fed them. Given the huge civilian death toll compared to the amount of weapons captured, this is quite clear. Karl von Gottberg, like Delavanger, was another Himmler protégé. He was appointed SS and police leader for the General District of Belarus in June 1942. Also like Delavanger, he had been in trouble for financial improprieties when money had gone missing whilst he was posted to Prague. In Belarus, his speciality was anti-gang operations, to use his words. He would get the full support of Delavanger. Whole regions were declared gang territory. The residents were then abducted or murdered and the houses were destroyed. Von Gottberg developed new strategies for combating partisans in Soviet territory. In a rapid series of commando operations, the Gottberg Combat Group attacked suspected partisan bases on its own initiative. From the 14th of March 1943, von Gottberg was also the representative of the higher SS and police leader for Central Russia, Erich von den Bach Zalewski. To give an idea of the violence that was happening even in 1942, we have this document from the British National Archive. It's an intercept, decoded at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, of a message sent to the Reichsführer SS, RFSS, that's to say Heinrich Himmler, and the Chief of the Order Police, Chef Orpo Kurt Dalug. On the Bobrus Mogilev Road, there was a skirmish with partisans. Sixteen men from the 51st Police Battalion were killed. The town of Borki, where weapons and ammunition were found, was levelled in the usual manner. The inhabitants were liquidated. From Higher SS and Police Leader Central Russia, HSSPF Rusland Mitte, Erik von den Bach Zalewski. What this message does not say is the number of victims. On the 20th of June 2020, this monument was unveiled in Borki. It is a memorial of the burnt villages of the Mogilev region. According to the memorial, on the 15th of June 1942, a major punitive operation was launched. That day the Nazis destroyed not only the village of Borki, but also several adjacent settlements, along with their inhabitants. More than 2,000 civilians were murdered. Some of them were burned alive. I'll read you some of the details from the memorial. The elements of the memorial complex reproduce the horror of the tragedy in Borki, are arranged in a chain of sculptural compositions. Belarus, the grieving mother, the street, the flame, and the well. At the end of the improvised street, a stone with a message to descendants was installed and a park was laid out, personifying life. The house was burned and destroyed. The ruins of its roof dome rise above the central image, the figure of a grieving mother frozen by an empty cradle, deprived of children and a future by the attackers. There are no more houses in this rural street, only fragments of their charred walls that show where they once stood. The things left in them are a symbol of the suddenly interrupted peaceful life and vulnerability to human cruelty. The charred logs are the testimonies of people who survived that terrible tragedy. 
In the space of the destroyed barn, a composition unfolds that resembles fire and smoke, an image of the enraged elements in which living people can be found. We cannot imagine their suffering, but in our consciousness we feel the horror of that tragedy. Before us appear the figures of victims sentenced to a painful death. Then there is the well. The black well, full of tears, a place of sorrow and memory of tortured children thrown alive into this place of giving water and life. The circles on the water are traces of our tears, frozen forever. This is the reality of the message sent by von den Baxalewski to Himmler and der Lug. However, such tragedies were to continue for another two years. On the occasion of his first operation, codenamed Nuremberg, von Gottberg reported on the 5th December 1942, enemy deaths, 799 bandits, over 300 suspected gang members and over 1,800 Jews. Own losses, 2 dead and 10 wounded. You have to be lucky. An order of Gottberg dated the 7th of December 1942 read as follows. Every bandit, Jew and gypsy is considered an enemy. And of course it was up to the individual to decide if the person in front of him was a Jew or a gypsy. In an area described as being bandit territory, said von Gottberg in an order dated the 1st of August 1943, everyone will be fair game in the future. The Kampfgruppe von Gottberg was together with the Sonderkommando Dielewanger and the Kaminsky Brigade coordinated by Erich von den Baxalewski. It was responsible for countless mass murders of civilians in Belarus. For example, in Operation Emterfest 1, from the 18th of January to the 26th of January 1943, the result was 805 dead, 1,165 special treatment, that's to say murdered, with own losses of 6 dead and 17 wounded. In Operation Enterfest 2, and own losses of 5 dead and 38 wounded. In November 1943, the Kampfgruppe, together with the Kampfgruppe Jekland, carried out Operation Heinrich, which had to be aborted due to a Soviet offensive. On the 5th of December 1943, Dielewanger was awarded the German Cross and Gold for his services in the fight against partisans. According to the award application, Dillevanger's unit had destroyed 15,000 bandits, captured 1,100 rifles and recorded 92 deaths in its own ranks. Dillevanger also took casualties and he needed to replace these men, the ordinary soldiers he found in the Soviet Union. His main source of recruits for NCOs and officers was amongst German criminals and the concentration camps were his recruiting grounds. The personnel files of potential recruits were sent to him in the course of preparing this video, I came across files of such potential recruits for Sonderkommando Dielewanger in the Archivum Akt Novik in Warsaw. I have their names and their dates of birth. None are likely to be alive now, but in Germany there's the right to privacy. And for example, when Christopher Browning wrote Ordinary Men, he had to give aliases for most of the people he was writing about. Of course, he knew the real names as he saw the original files, just as I have seen the original files in this case. Having given this some thought, I chose not to give their names and not to show the files, not wanting to find German archives in the future unhelpful towards me. I am, however, convinced that others may well have used the names in articles. In 2007, the Polish IPN, the Institute for National Remembrance, published lists of people from the Dillewanger Sonderkommando who were still alive. As far as Dillewang is concerned, he had access to a stream of officers and NCOs from the concentration camps, from those who quite literally were prepared to fight their way out. Dillewanger did not fight the partisans alone. He could team up with other units such as that commanded by Waldemar Fagelin, brother of the adjutant to Himmler. A supposedly autonomous Russian government was set up in what was called the Lokot Self-Governing District. Here Dillewanger fought partisans together with the Kaminsky Brigade, another group of Russians which fought for the Nazis using extremely 
brutal means. In Operation Regenschar, up to 7,000 bandits were reported as killed. Frühlingsfest, 7,011 bandits reported as killed and 1,065 weapons captured. And Cormoran, 7,697 bandits reported as killed and 325 weapons captured. The villages of the victims were burnt down. As always, note the difference between the amount of bandits killed and the amount of weapons captured. In July 1944, the Eastern Front totally collapsed. From a starting point very approximately equivalent to the Eastern border of Belarus today, the Red Army tore apart Army Group Center and raced forward, held back only by its own lack of supplies and supported by partisans which harassed, cut off and demoralized German stragglers. Dillewanger's unit, operating behind the lines, got out before the army did, but such was the speed of the Red Army that many of them were caught up in the fighting. The unit suffered at least 80 losses. By the end of the month, Dillewanger found himself back in East Germany, in Wuk, today Elk, in East Prussia. The world may have thought that Dillewanger's criminal career was over. It would have been very wrong. Dillewanger was now about to commit the worst crimes of his life, the crimes that would put him in the history books. In part three, we shall see how Oskar Dillewanger murdered tens of thousands of civilians in Warsaw in August 1944 during the uprising in the Polish capital.